Hello, everyone. I'm Elon Levy. Today is May 23rd, 2024, and this is the first daily briefing of the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office. Whatever platform you're watching from, please feel free to submit your questions, and I'll take them at the end. Today is day 230 of the October 7th war. Israeli military operations continue in Gaza with two goals, the destruction of Hamas's military and governing capabilities, and the safe return of the 128 hostages still trapped in Gaza. We all saw the footage released yesterday of Hamas terrorists seizing female Israeli soldiers on October 7th from their base inside Israel. These young women, Liri Albag, Karina Arayev, Adam Berger, Daniela Gilboa, and Naama Levy, were beaten, bloodied, terrified, lined up against a wall, and forced to beg for their lives as their friends lay dead on the ground around them. These five women have been held in the Hamas terror dungeons in Gaza for nearly eight months now, with no visits from the Red Cross. We know that Hamas has raped Israeli women in captivity. What is Hamas doing to Liri, to Karina, to Agam, to Daniel, and to Naama? All of the hostages must be released immediately. It is so important to keep putting up hostage posters and don't let anyone forget them. Anyone who wants to get the hostages out must increase pressure on Hamas and its backers, Qatar, Turkey, and Iran, to let them go now. Pressure on Israel only weakens Israel, strengthens Hamas, and makes a hostage release deal less likely. Egypt also needs to be pressured. And that's because Egypt is blocking humanitarian aid from entering Gaza. If you haven't heard about that, ask yourself why that might be. Humanitarian aid is piling up inside Egypt because Egypt refuses to let it move into Gaza. Why is Egypt refusing to let the aid move into Gaza? Because Egypt is angry that Hamas no longer controls the Gaza side of the Rafah crossing. The IDF controls that crossing now. In addition to blocking aid from going through the Rafah crossing, Egypt will not allow aid sitting in Egypt to get to Israel so that it can enter Gaza via Israel's crossing, Karim Shalom. It's absurd, it's an outrage, and the whole world must call it out. Israel's prime minister has said he wants to see the Rafah crossing open again as soon as possible, and he hopes that Israel can reach an understanding with Egypt over the matter. Egypt must end its blockade of Gaza. The world must pressure Egypt to stop blocking aid. Meanwhile, Israel has been sending enormous amounts of food into Gaza, even as Hamas continues to fight. According to a new academic study based on a careful investigation of the registry of aid going into Gaza, an average of 3,200 calories per person per day have entered Gaza over the past four months. 3,200 calories, that's enough to make you fat. That's 60% more than a woman's recommended daily calorie intake. It's easily enough for three meals a day and a lot of dessert. Just yesterday, 298 trucks were transferred from Israel to Gaza via the Kerem Shalom and Erez crossings, mostly food, and it's far more than went in before the war. Israel's crossings to Gaza are open, even though Hamas continues to attack them. According to the UN's own figures, far more food is entering Gaza now than before the war. Israel doesn't have a policy of starvation. It has a policy of flooding Gaza with aid, even after Gaza flooded Israel with terrorists. Israel is facilitating the entry of unlimited quantities of food, water, medicine, and shelter equipment into Gaza, even as Egypt blocks it, and even as Hamas continues to attack the crossings. Israel is letting in aid by air, land, and sea as much as the world wants to send in. It is outrageous and frankly criminal that international actors are trying to sell you a mirror image of reality, claiming that Israel is blocking aid or trying to starve civilians in Gaza. That's a lie based on Hamas propaganda, and you need to call it out. If so much food is entering Gaza and it's not reaching the people who need it, the question must be asked, and I hope the director of the World Food Programme, Cindy McCain, who's been spreading this lie, asks that question, where is all the food going? The US military installed a floating pier off the coast of Gaza, working together with the Israel Defense Forces to make that possible. Aid has entered Gaza from the pier, 
But on Tuesday, the Pentagon spokesman, Major General Patrick Ryder, said he doesn't believe that any of that aid from the pier had actually reached the people of Gaza. And that's because since the start of this war and before, Hamas has been stealing and hoarding aid while waging war against Israel sending that aid. And UN agencies are covering that up with zero accountability from your governments around the world. That must change. Finally, a word about the diplomatic front. Ireland, Norway and Spain are encouraging the next October 7th massacre. They are telling Hamas that barbaric atrocities work and they are repaying them. After the Hamas rapist regime used Gaza as a base for crimes against humanity on October 7th, Ireland, Norway and Spain have decided to reward them by recognizing a Palestinian state that does not exist. I wish I were joking, but this is what is happening. Ireland is encouraging Hamas to abduct more Jewish babies. Norway is encouraging Hamas to rape more Jewish women. Spain is encouraging Hamas to burn more Jewish families. The ashes of the victims of the next October 7th will be on the hands of the Irish, Norwegian, and Spanish leaders who are telling Palestinian terrorists that burning Jews alive is a good way to make progress. The governments of Ireland, Norway, and Spain are making peace less likely because they are rewarding Palestinian atrocities instead of punishing them. Here's what the leaders of Ireland, Norway, and Spain could be doing to advance peace. Tell Palestinian leaders to stop funding terrorism. Tell Palestinian leaders to start implementing democratic reforms. And tell Palestinian leaders to start teaching the people that the path to peace and a better future is through peace with Israel, instead of a dream of replacing it. Peace will come to our region when a Palestinian leader is brave enough to tell his people, we are ready to compromise. We are living to live in peace with a Jewish state, and we are ready to stop teaching our children to hate their neighbors. Palestinians must not be allowed to look back at October 7th as a national holiday. They must not be allowed to think of gang rape as a tool that advances their national cause, and that is what Ireland, Norway, and Spain are telling them. The whole world must tell the Palestinians loud and clear, terror doesn't pay. It's 2024. Nobody gets to burn Jews alive and get away with it anymore. Certainly not get a prize. Friends, keep putting up the hostage posters. Keep lobbying for more pressure on Hamas's backers, Qatar, Turkey, and Iran to demand that Hamas let the hostages go now. Tell Egypt to open the Rafah crossing so that aid can flow into Gaza and tell Hamas to stop stealing it. Remind world leaders that peace comes through compromise and not through rewarding and encouraging terrorism. Stand up to the campaign of lies against Israel because we cannot let that campaign win. We here at the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office will be back every Sunday to Thursday at 3 p.m. Israel time, 8 a.m. Eastern, on all the major social media platforms. I'll now be happy to take your questions. Please feel free to drop a comment in the chat wherever you're following. Please. We have a question about Rafah. In advance of Israel's operations in Rafah, the Biden administration said that it had seen no plan to evacuate civilians from Rafah. Yet there are reports that civilians did evacuate. What changed? Uh, when Israel began its operation to move into Rafah to destroy the last four Hamas battalions, the United States said it hadn't seen a plan to keep civilians safe and urged Israel to keep civilians safe. The US has, for all intents and purposes, now given a green light to Israel to move into Rafah and destroy the last Hamas battalions after most of the people taking shelter there have been successfully evacuated to a humanitarian zone. In fact, it was reported in the Wall Street uh, Journal, uh, for example, that after the original warnings, uh, a, a member of the administration told the press it's fair to say the Israelis have updated their plans. They have incorporated the concerns that the US has taken into account. It's important to remember, the war that Israel is fighting after October 7th is a war against Hamas, not against the Palestinian people. Israel wants to target Hamas, and that is why it wants civilians to get out of harm's way. Israel has been urging them to leave Hamas strongholds, and frankly, it's outrageous that instead of cooperating with Israel's efforts to keep civilians safe, UN agencies have been trying to keep them in Hamas strongholds where Hamas can use them as human shields. 
The world told Israel what it already knows. Civilians must be protected. But you can't tell Israel not to attack Hamas and Rafah because civilians might be hurt, but then say that Israel can't help civilians get out of harm's way. And to date, nearly a million Palestinians have been safely evacuated out of Rafah to the humanitarian zone, mostly doing something the world said wasn't possible, but Israel knows is possible, to get civilians out of harm's way so we can go after the monsters who were responsible for October 7th. And I have every confidence the Israeli military will continue working as much as it can with international actors to try to keep civilians out of harm's way so we can go after Hamas and destroy the military machine that has been consistently threatening another October 7th massacre. You don't put out three quarters of a fire. The war cannot end with Hamas still holding hostages or free to perpetrate another October 7th massacre as it's threatening to do. What is Israel going to do about the International Criminal Court potentially seeking warrants for the arrest of the Israeli Prime Minister and the Israeli Defense Minister? Is Israel concerned about this or is Israel dismissing news? First of all, the ICC has no jurisdiction over Israel or Israel's leaders. And that's because Israel isn't a signatory to, the, signatory to the Rome Statute. This is a court set up through an international treaty to which Israel has no part. It has no jurisdiction and it has no authority over Israel. Now, of course, the request for arrest warrants is an act of political theater. If you need any evidence, Israel's defense minister found out that the ICC prosecutor is seeking his arrest through CNN. That is not a way that a professional legal court works. That is a sign of a political witch hunt. But take note, not only is the equivalence drawn between Israel's leaders and Hamas absurd, because Israel is fighting to prevent another October 7th massacre, while Hamas is fighting to perpetrate another October 7th massacre, because Israel is a democratic country fighting a jihadi death cult, while Hamas is a jihadi death cult. The accusations themselves are totally absurd. The ICC prosecutor wants to stop Israel's leaders on charges of extermination, but no army in the history of the world has gone further than Israel to try to keep civilians safe, even though terrorists are hiding underneath them, building a tunnel network one and a half times longer than the New York subway, hiding inside hospitals and schools. Israel's been urging them to get out of harm's way. And even according to the UN's numbers, if you consider that 14,000 Hamas terrorists have been killed, we're talking about a combatant to civilian ratio unheard of in the history of warfare. Israel didn't go in all guns a-blazing into Rafah. It spent time urging civilians to leave. That's the opposite of extermination. That is what you would expect a professional law-abiding army to do to uphold its obligations, obligations that Israel is upholding in fiendishly difficult circumstances where no country has ever tried to implement humanitarian law, where terrorists are so systematically abusing it. Take the allegation of starvation again. Nothing could be further from the truth, since the beginning of the war, over half a million trucks of humanitarian aid have entered Gaza, mostly carrying food. As I said earlier, a new study finds since the beginning of the war, 3,200 calories per man, woman, child, and baby every day going into the Gaza Strip. Israel's facilitating unlimited quantities of aid into the Gaza Strip, even as its crossings come under fire. Instead of blocking aid, Israel has opened three new land crossings, built a new sea pier together with the United States, and facilitated airdrops of aid into the northern Gaza Strip. We need our supporters to push back against these ridiculous allegations, not only the false equivalence drawn between Israel and the Hamas death cult, but against these accusations which show this is a continuation through legal means of the ongoing political war against Israel, by those who do not want Israel to defend itself, who want to abandon the hostages in the hands of their rapist captors, and who want to leave Hamas on its feet, free to fight another day and perpetrate another October 7th massacre. How is Israel reacting to the death of the Iranian president in a helicopter crash? Does this news affect the way that Israel looks to Iran and the threats surrounding Israel? Israel hasn't responded to the death of Iran's president in a helicopter crash. I think many people here in Israel were frankly appalled to see the UN Security Council holding a minute's silence in memory of the man known as the butcher or the hangman of Tehran for his role in the execution of political dissidents, Iranian political dissidents, in the immediate aftermath of the Islamic Revolution. Let's remember that in Iran, the president is elected after careful selection by the supreme leader 
who controls all political power. It means the president in Iran uh, takes orders, by and large, from the supreme leader who controls the IR at GC, doesn't have much wriggle room, but is ultimately an extremist figure who over the last years of his presidency was working to expand Iran's aggressive campaign of imperial control around the Middle East. And that is why Israel now finds itself under attack on eight different fronts. This isn't a war between Israel and a Palestinian terror organization. It is a war between Israel and Iran's proxies. Israel is under attack from Hamas in Gaza, from Iran-backed terrorists in Judea and Samaria, from the Iranian proxy army in Lebanon, Hezbollah, which joined this war on October 8th, from the Iran-backed Houthi pirate rebels in Yemen that have been firing missiles at Israel, from Syria, from Iraqi militants in, uh, in Iraq as well, directly from Iran with an unprecedented attack of 350 ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones, and in the diaspora as well, where Iran has been trying to sow chaos and encourage political violence around the world. That strategy is not going to change whoever is the president in Iran, and we need international pressure on Iran to isolate it, to choke off its funds, and stop Iran trying to sow chaos and instability in the Middle East, and to back the forces of stability. Israel, together with its neighbors and the so-called moderate Sunni states, we had an excellent process with the Abraham Accords, normalization with the UAE, with Morocco, with Sudan, with Bahrain, and we need to see that process continuing in order to contain Iran's aggression in the Middle East, whoever the next president is. And our last question is, what should people be doing in their own communities to stand up for Israel? We need you to have difficult conversations with your friends outside the Jewish community. It's not enough to hit like, to hit follow, to hit share of content on social media. We need you to have difficult conversations with people who aren't necessarily fans or friends of Israel, because people still can be persuaded. You can't let the only people speaking to them being the mobs in the streets or those spreading outrageous lies against Israel. They need to hear the truth coming from you as well. They need you to engage them in direct conversations and keep fighting. Keep putting up the hostage posters. Keep engaging people in difficult conversations. When there is a radio call in, phone the radio. Send a letter to the editor and the newspaper as well. Keep fighting our fight because the Israel's fight is the fight of the diaspora as well. It's impossible to think that Israel will fall victim to the lies that we, the world is telling about Israel and that the diaspora is going to get off scot-free. These struggles are interlinked, and we need people to stand up to the bullies, stand up to the intimidation, take the news and the information that we are providing here at the Israeli citizen spokesperson's office and keep fighting until we get all the hostages home and defeat Israel's enemies. Thanks for watching. Drop a comment below. Don't forget to like, share, and hit subscribe to stay updated with our latest content. Until next time, stay informed and inspired. This is Dajabnik signing off.